My name is Andrew Westover, and I'm the key pairing director of education and public engagement at the New Museum. I join you today from the unceded land of Lenape people, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to Lenape people and elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. On behalf of the New Museum, I am glad to welcome you to tonight's panel conversation entitled On Faith, the Written Word. This program is in conjunction with the exhibition Faith Ringgold, American People, co-curated by Massimiliano Gioni, Edlis Neeson Artistic Director, and Gary Carrion Muriari, Krauss Family Curator. I will moderate tonight's conversation, which features panelists Joy Bivens, Director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, Stephanie Sparling Williams, Curator of American Art at the Brooklyn Museum, and Candace Williams, artist and writer. Programs like this are core to the New Museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. I would particularly like to thank education and public engagement staff members, Austin Bowes and Derek Wright, as well as the entire New Museum team for their help bringing this program together. New Museum public programs are generously supported by the Bowery Council and digital initiatives are supported by Hermione and David B. Heller. We also thank our members and supporters like you who help make these programs possible. A few logistical notes before we begin. This program will last for approximately one hour. If you would like to ask a question, feel free to use the Q&A function at any time by clicking the Q&A button located on the bottom of your screen to type your question. Please note the program is being recorded, so your question will be recorded as well. If there is time, our speakers will answer the questions throughout tonight's conversation. And finally, I encourage you to learn more about upcoming public programs on our website newmuseum.org. Now, let's go ahead and begin. So tonight's conversation brings together a truly stellar group of panelists. Each of them has done incredible work on their own, and they each also compellingly interact with, consider, and reflect notes and themes that expand across Ringgold's body of work and current exhibition at the New Museum. I'll note too, for all of you watching, if you have not yet had the opportunity to see the exhibition in person, this is the very last weekend that it will be open. The exhibition closes after Sunday. So please, if you can, do make time to go ahead and go see it. But for tonight's conversation, we'll actually start with our first panelist and proceed our way through with each describing a little bit about their own work and their own interactions with Ringgold, her work and her legacy. So we'll start please with Stephanie. Stephanie, if you wouldn't mind joining us. Great, welcome Stephanie. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much, Andrew, for that warm welcome and the introduction and for the invitation to join my fellow panelists in discussion tonight. Thank you to those tuning in. Wow, y'all made it. It's Friday at 7.30. <laughs> um, Good job. This is this is incredible to see you all signed in and you know just in advance for your generous contributions in the questions in your Q&A. Um, I think it's going to make this conversation even more rich. Um, I realize that this panel is focused on um, artist extraordinaire Faith Ringgold's practice as an author and her use of the written word and her visual art. However, my interest in Ringgold and the entry point and intersection with the artist's practice in my own work is through the spoken word, through speech, and even more specifically through the writing of her daughter, Professor Emerita, at the City College of New York, Michelle Wallace. Um, next slide, please, just so folks can see the book um, I'm holding up. In fact, it was through Wallace's book, Invisibility Blues, that I'm holding here and that's on the screen, that I really came to know and better understand Ringgold's work. And it was this very same text that I had re that really laid the conceptual groundwork for my own thinking around Black women's art more broadly through the lens of speaking out of turn. And I just, I want to just note this wonderful mural that is on view at the New Museum. I hope you get to see it, but if you miss it, please come to Brooklyn this month because it will be on view for the Women's House, um, which is just a tremendous iconic work. And I, I think it's a good omen that it's also on this, this cover. Um, but it was really truly Michelle Wallace's incisive analysis of Black feminist creative practices as existing outside of and beyond what is articulated um, or even can really be understood through the language language of tradition. Um, and Wallace really puts it this way, if I could have the next slide, please. Quote, 
I realized that to define a tradition that integrates Black female critical voices is to be forced to confront the way in which such voices have been systematically excluded from previous notions of tradition. It is, in other words, a tradition of speaking out of turn, end quote. And Lucy Lepard, in her own writing on Wallace, um, you know, is really thinking about, and I think Wallace is too, um, that this outside of, you know, is outside of the dizzying kind of um, blur of white male um, supremacy, right, in the art world in particular, and masculine, you know, kind of dominance. And so in her own writing and activists, um, you know, faith, and, and she's really thinking about, she sets um, Ringgold's practice up in these terms, right, that I feel are so, um, so rich, you know, and so in Ringgold's own writing and activism, you know, she is bold and incisive, timely and yet ahead of her time, you know, unapologetic and self-reflexive, truth-telling, experimental, and witty, if you've seen, you know, several of the quilts on the show. Ringgold's words are often handwritten, tender and yet unyielding, strong and poetic, searching and interpolating. Um, next slide, please. And my interest in Ringgold's art really peaked during my graduate work, where I was studying the effect of text, particularly the act of reading on spectators. You know, I was intrigued by artists like Ringgold, Lorraine O'Grady, Carrie Mae Weems, Lorna Simpson, Adrian Piper, just to name a few, you know, and their use of text in their work that prompted spectators to read and what that reading did right, how it functioned in the space of the American Art Museum context, you know, did reading present a disruption, you know, were spectators being forced into language, you know, or relational speech, perhaps, you know, particularly language being willed or wielded by these Black women artists. Um, and Rickles' practice in particular, as, you know, her daughter articulates so cogently for decades, you know, before the art world, before the show, you know, even came about, you know, writing her mom or her mother, excuse me, writing her mother wrinkled into this very tradition that has been built out of turn, you know, always on time, but never the right time, right, for Black women's inclusion. Never one's turn to speak, which is why the writing became so fascinating to me. You know, what were these women saying through their work and who, you know, who was listening. I felt so drawn to this toggle between the visual and aesthetic and the literary and the written um, and the impact of speech and art that I dedicated my entire dissertation to um, a far too ambitious study of this very tension, this out of turn or against the grain rupture of aesthetic expectations. You know, Wallace more recently spoke to this very phenomenon in an earlier public program for the same exhibition and about her mother's choice to use vertical text in particular in her Tibetan um, Tonka paintings as reflective of a desire to slow people down, you know, a strategic maneuver that was about taking one's time. Not only was Ringel going into um, you know, visually engage with the words of Sojourner Truth and other Black women luminaries, Ringgold's work then formally demands slowness and care of its spectators. And I'm timing myself and I'm at five minutes and 30 seconds. And so um, I'm mindful of our allotted um, five minutes. I'm going to skip ahead to my last slide, please. And, you know, we were asked to share the entry point and connections between Ringgold's creative practice and our own, but I also wanted to um, move quickly beyond my scholarly work, which is, you know, really rooted in kind of teasing out what it might mean to understand um, speaking out of turn as a, as a methodology, right, a, a strategic approach to how we understand women's work and Black women in particular in the space of the Fine Art Museum. But I wanted to also um, move beyond this to note how the artist practice her bold and generous aesthetic shapes. Um, you know, no, really, I'll say it, it affirms my curatorial work now as the curator of an important historic collection of American art. You know, through her work, Ringgold models what it means to hold Blackness and womanness in reverent capaciousness. You know, also um, thinking through and, and really kind of asking us to delight in Black humor and joy, which are two powerful nodes through which I access her work. Um, and also two orientations that I feel are overlooked, you know, possibly because they're often revealed in her writing, you know, and there is a lot of writing in a show um, like the one that is presented now at the New Museum. 
And as we know, Black joy in particular has historically always functioned out of turn and against the grain of, at the very least, the art historical tradition. Ringel affirms across canvas, soft sculpture, mural, protest banner, tanka, story quilt, and print. What it feels, you know, is most urgent about my curatorial approach and work in this moment, which is really a deep investment in centering Black feminist ways of knowing and experiencing the world, particularly art worlds. Um, so as I began, and as Michelle Wallace um, illuminates, go get this book. Seriously, um, this is really a tradition in which I proudly continue, indeed, of speaking out of turn. So I'm going to end there. Thank you so much and, and stay tuned. Thank you so much, Stephanie. We will now leap right forward to, to Joy Bivens. Joy, I'll turn it over to you. I'll change my orientation here so you don't have to look at my refrigerator. <laughs> uh, <laughs> good evening. And um, I just want to say, first of all, I'd like to say how grateful I am to be here. Um, I have had the pleasure of viewing the exhibition a couple of times. And it really is a monumental and fitting showcase of the conse consequential work of an American master. So I'm uh, coming from this, from a, a, a bit of a different vantage point uh, than my two uh, panel mates here. Um, the Schomburg Center, which I have the privilege of, of directing at this, at this juncture is a place where we have multiple works of Ms. Ringel in our collection. And indeed one of those works is among those featured in the exhibition. Can we go back to the first slide? Uh, um, and um, I am going to talk a bit about Ringel, but whenever I have the, the opportunity to have a platform, I always am going to share a bit about who we are as an organization and I know some of you are familiar with the Schomburg Center, but I also am always uh, cognizant of the fact that some, some folks don't know who, what the Schomburg Center is and, and what we do. So um, this image that I have here is the Schomburg Center, it's our entrance. We are at 135th Street and Malcolm X Boulevard, or if you are old school, um, Lenox Boulevard uh, in, in Harlem, uh, Faith Ringo's home. And what we do at which, if we could go to the next slide. So who we are is one of the New York Public Library's renowned research libraries. Our primary focus is collecting, documenting and preserving the histories and cultures of people of African descent. We do, we've done this over nearly a hundred years and have amassed a collection of about 11 million objects held in five distinct collecting divisions. And the personal collection of bibliophile and diaspora collect collector Arturo Alfonso Schomburg is the foundation of our collection. So that's an image of Mr. Schomburg here, our namesake, just so you get a sense of who he is. Um, next slide, please. I mentioned that we collect across five divisions and those include the Jean Blackwell Hudson General Research and Reference Division, which is a, a non-circulating research division where you can come and, and page books and, and spend time in reading rooms and look at our materials, which include books, journals, newspapers, microforms about people of African descent. Again, because of this, this uh, question or this relationship of the visual, visual fine arts and text or, or writing and the word, I think this is, this is where the Schomburg enters into this conversation. And just a, a quick note about the highlights, you know, uh, it, it includes West Indian history and culture, Haitian literature and history. So we cross a lot of different geographical boundaries in our, in our collecting. Next slide, please. Um, this is just an image of the Aaron Douglas reading room, which is where the Jean Blackwell Hudson uh, division is where you come to do your research. So next slide, please. Um, manuscripts, archives, and rare books is precisely what you would think that the Schomburg, uh, which is often called an archive, is known for. So this is your personal papers, your organizational records, and so on and so forth. And highlighted there in blue are some of the, the um, big collections within our 
in our holdings, James Baldwin's papers, Arturo Alfo Alfonso Schomburg's papers, Malcolm X collection, Lorraine Hansberry papers, Sonny Rollins, and I'll get to it a, a bit later, um, Dr. Maya Angelou's papers. So the next slide, please. Just another view of a reading room. So you get a sense of who we are, where we are, and how we not only live with the text, but we also live with the visual arts that are represented in our collection. Next slide, please. Moving image and recorded sound is precisely what it sounds like, audio and moving image, which is a new collecting, relatively new for the Schomburg. Um, just a few decades old as opposed to several decades old, which is what's represented in the rest of our collection. Um, so I'm gonna move through this uh, quickly. Next slide, please. All of these sl slides or these images are just so you get a sense of place and we can go to the next slide. Photographs and prints is one of our largest divisions and gets us closer to the next slide, which is our fifth division that I wanna talk about tonight, which is art and artifacts. When this is our collection of fine art, applied art, material, culture, objects, and we have been collecting materials that date from the 17th century onward. Um, the emphasis, however, is strongly on 20th and 21st century visual art of the Americas and, Afri and Africa. So the highlights of this include Augusta Savage, who, whose uh, piece you see here, uh, Meta Warwick Fuller, Aaron Douglas murals. We have strong black arts movement, representation, and we have textiles. Can you go to the next slide, please? Another image of where our materials live and how they, how they uh, exist in space. Next slide, please. So I brought all that together because I wanted to talk a little bit about how we collect and how we have been collecting over the past uh, nine decades. We do exhibition, we do public programs, we do education programs, we do curricula development, publications, and most importantly, we share our collections. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So the previous slides were just uh, visuals of all of those things that I mentioned, public programs, um, which we have a literary festival coming up on June 18th, um, but also our junior scholars program, which is for young people to come in and, and really gear up for their scholarship later in life and use our holdings as a way to do that. So one of the things I wanted, I mentioned is that our collections are, um, they cross a lot of medium, they show showcase uh, the breadth and diversity of, of Black creative production. And within that are um, a few Faith Ringel holdings, including the piece that's in the show right now from the Black Light series, um, but also these are Arthur Schomburg, Mr. Schomburg was sometimes known as Arturo, sometimes known as Arthur. Um, but these are story quilts created in 1988 for a contest actually at the Schomburg Center um, to represent the history of Mr. Schomburg and represent the history of the Schomburg Center. And within these, you see very, uh, very um, traditional or the, the types of techniques we associate with Ms. Ringel's work, but also the ways in which she's not just pulling in the text, but she's also pulling in the history. So there is uh, the quilt from 1930s to 1930, uh, 1920s to 1930s, that's the Schomburg's Genesis, 1940s to 1950s. If we go to the next one, I'm sorry, um, 1960s, 1970s, and then 1970s to 1980s. So you see her not just, uh, not just using this medium, but also referencing really critical authors and um, literary producers. So within this, she uses um, not just Arthur Schomburg or Arturo Schomburg, but Langston Hughes, Richard Wright, Zora Neale Hurston, um, James Baldwin, 
also um, Tori, Toni Morrison, and then also Alice uh, Walker's pieces or quotes from Alice Walker's The Color Purple. And this was created specifically for a contest at the Schomburg Center. Um, the piece did not end up uh, winning that contest, but the Schomburg Center later acquired these pieces. Um, and this represents not only the type of work she does, but this really unique connection between the written word and textile, the written word and visual arts, which is where in many ways we live as an institution. Our archives are often um, engaged by artists, by all types of artists, not just visual artists, as vindicating evidences of the past, of Black past, of Black histories, of Black cultures. And in that ways, and, and in that way, she engaged that for us back in the 1980s. Next slide, please. This is the piece from our collection that is represented in the exhibition at the New Museum. But I also wanted to let you all know that there were related collections, including Michelle Wallace's papers, the Maya Angelou papers, where there's correspondence between Dr. Angelou and Faith Ringgold, Sydney Tillman papers. So there are all these ways in which you can engage our collections um, to learn more about the work of this artist and those she had contact with. Um, but then also one of the things that people often say about whenever I'm out and they're talking about the Schomburg Center, they say, oh yeah, you know, I really love that museum. Um, but where we distinguish ourselves from museums is we are a library. And as a library, we collect so that all of the public can engage. So any of these things that I show you this evening are things that you can um, contact us and see at your leisure, if they're for your own research, um, um, if you're an academic researcher or if you are um, an amateur researcher, these are things that we collect to make available to you. And so I, again, I just wanted to uh, bring this aspect of the work into the conversation, and I hope that you found it um, useful. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joy, for sharing more about the context of the Schomburg, what it means in Harlem and as a research center, and also its relationship with Ringgold. And, and we'll explore that a bit further here too shortly. Candace, I'd love to invite you now to come forward and, and share a bit more from your perspective. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I would um, start our slides and uh, I think we can probably just set the slideshow at around 10 seconds per slide and I'll just let you know when to pause them. Um, so happy to be in conversation with Joy and Stephanie. Um, I think you can pause here. Uh, and I also got to, the chance to go through the museum and see the exhibition of um, <clears throat> of Faith Ringgold and it's um, very just beautiful. Um, I think some of my first and initial thoughts, which I'll just sort of talk over the slides um, through, are that, you know, as an artist and a publisher, as a sort of would-be writer, um, uh, and uh, also, you know, the work with Cassandra Press and especially with organizing classrooms. Um, I think one of the things that really struck me going through the exhibition was this notion of truth telling and also being invited to speak about how Ringgold uses the written word. Um, what became really clear to me going through the exhibition was that the transcendence of the word uh, was so present in, in form and in action and in collaboration and in composition in the work. Um, and it reminded me of a text that I've recently finished that I'll talk about a bit later uh, by Kristen Brent Jook uh, called Color by Fox. And it also reminded me of a text from um, sort of also relevant to Ringgold's Harlem Renaissance origins, uh, Zora Neale Hurston's The Characteristics of Negro Expression. So I guess I kind of want to like at the start of the slideshow just express the deep indebtedness I feel is, um, you know, coming up in terms of being able to witness this form of composition, which transcends composition, I think, and then also falls back into form and, um, 
and that is sort of a black feminist praxis uh, for engaging with the world and then for engaging with expression. Um, so I want to link uh, Zook to Hurston and then also to uh, Ringgold and then um, just invite you guys to see some of the sort of parallels that I saw with my own work and practice uh, throughout the show. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I think you can move to the, these are some of the characteristics of Negro expression that Zora Neale Hurston uh, pulls out in her essay that I you know, really recommend you, you can download um, online. Uh, but drama, the will to adorn, metaphor and simile, the double descriptive, verbal nouns, nouns from verbs, angularity, asymmetry, dancing, Negro folklore, cultural heroes, imitation, the absence of the concept of privacy, the juke and dialect. You can move to the next slide. And then you can just kind of let them run. Um, so yeah, this debt to Ringgold and I think modes of, of uh, capturing Black um, essentially cosmologies that move from material praxis to hyper conceptual um, praxis. That's this notion that I think Zook brings up of black complexity. Um, I think also being indebted to, um, you know, the pioneering of this kind of this level of complexity and level of compositional nuance. Um, I think about the notion of truth telling and truth is a psychic structure. So truth is sort of a building or being able to build out of both um, line, form, plane, intersection, but also out of reflection, out of genuflection, um, out of archaeology, um, and then also out of, um, you know, I think something that Zook will talk about, we'll still see in the slide coming up, um, autobiography. So I think thinking through um, sociology as well as a practice of sort of like seeing uh, blackness and black thought, holding black thought, um, but also expressing, you know, the limitations of black thought and social policies that enable genocide and the control of different social and societal narratives, um, I think leads, you know, or has produced a legacy from the Harlem Renaissance on, this is W.E.B. Du Bois's what he called life within the veil. Uh, so even infographics and thinking about socioeconomies that also need to be visualized and simultaneously while they're visualized are also commodified, captured, um, and really you know, galvanized by select groups of, of artists, especially thinking here about Ringgold and Adrian Piper, two types of political performance and um, aesthetic performance that essentially we, we still today look through for sociological implications and compositions, both social and aesthetic. Um, thinking here about Lauren Matori and fetishism and especially fetishism of um, modes of black communication and black social praxis, especially black feminist praxis. Uh, I think going through the Ringgold exhibition and just sort of seeing someone who's also watching people watching them um, fed very much into like how I think about Eurydice and mythology, African folklore, I think thinking through Glissant and Black theater and especially Black nationalism, forms of nationalism um, also impact and greatly impact the view of the, the performance and the political performances active in the Judson Three um, and Ringgold's work in the Judson Three, uh, speaking out about um, signage and signs and their capacity to hold um, space for further aestheticization and reclamation of certain social controls or powers or access points um, to social life. So yeah, I think uh, these are the, you can pause here actually. Another um, kind of composition of black complexity that I'm really interested in, we just, I just finished this, this book that I think, uh, also I was thinking about a lot going through the exhibition of, of Ringgold at New Museum. <clears throat> But here, another sort of like register of characteristics of Negro expression. These are, here Zook says, based on over a decade of researching shows that have Black cast and involve a significant degree of Black creative control. They found that four common traits appear consistently, um, which is autobiography or the meaning, meaning a tendency towards collective or individual authorship of the Black experience, improvisation or the practice of inventing and ad living, living unscripted dialogue or action aesthetics or certain pride in visual signifiers of blackness and drama or a marked desire for complex characterizations and emotionally challenging subject matter. And I think all these, uh, and also, you know, 
um, Hurston's register of these modes of expression are, are swirling in, in the Ringgold work uh, from the quilts and the quilts. I was thinking a lot about the quilts as a kind of almost TV. Um, you can move on to the next slide. A TV into Black experience that's using in-group language, um, which is, I think, as we understand through Hollywood and um, popular television is, is where, you know, there's a conflict of Black subjectivity. Um, and so in Ringgold's work, you see a kind of intimate space in which those in-group dynamics and politics are really expressed. Uh, I see that directly impacting how we understand media to properly function today, or, um, you know, how to say that, I guess, fights for fights on the part of Black authors for further complexity and for nuance um, in our media registers, more nuance in our media registers to act as political agency and power. These are two Cassandra, um, Cassandra texts. I'll just kind of let the slideshow run. And these are, you know, just many ways, I think, compositionally, and then also in terms of activating social lineage or philosophical thought, um, material praxis, performances, political power, um, even thinking through the word and how the word is transcended um, into action and then how that action sparks further collaboration and builds language, I think, um, are all ways that I feel my personal practice and the practice of the press are indebted to Ringgold. Was that five minutes? <laughs> That was wonderful. Thank you, Candace. Really, really illuminating, I think, across the board. And actually, if I could welcome all of you back so we can now have a bit of a conversation to pull this, pull these threads together. You know, one of the things that I find so compelling across each of your, your various practices and capacities is that you each do think really rigorously about language, about what words can hold, about what they can do to illuminate about what they also can limit and foreclose and what can be hidden or shrouded in words. And each of you, you know, are thinking about how artists are using words, whose words get held and wrinkle too across our practice is engaging with language very specifically and in different ways across, across the bounds of it. Stephanie, I'm wondering if perhaps we could start with you. I know you've thought really specifically about how artists use words, how they, as you said, you know, when they interject, when they don't who hears it, who doesn't. Maybe if you could speak a bit towards how you consider language and the written word specifically in relation to, to artistic practice. Well, thank you so much. I just wanna also thank Joy and Candice for, for their presentations. This was really great to, to learn more about your work through, through these slides and your words. Yeah, so I think language, you know, in, in my work, I'm often thinking about, or at least early on, I was thinking of language as, as first formal, like I was thinking of it, you know, putting these texts, like, how do we understand it first, not as a text, as something we read and understand and, you know, process through, you know, mostly English language, but how do we understand how text, you know, functions visually? Um, and I think that that's something that, you know, I write a lot about Lorraine O'Grady and, you know, how her practice, you know, this exercise it, it text almost becomes like another methodology and a medium, right? So a medium to master, um, which I always found really interesting. But then when you add, well, what is it saying? I think that's this other, um, other aspect of it that I think Faith Ringgold's work is so um, exciting because, you know, I think what I found in my research, at least that a lot of people don't read in the galleries, you know? Um, and, and I think especially, and what I found when you, when I studied, I watched for hours, I did kind of participant observation, very ethnographic research in art museums. I sat, you know, for, you know, about 12 hours with an Adrian Piper work cornered. Um, and what I found was the second that folks read enough to figure out what it was about, um, you know, language almost, you know, kind of subverted the looking process at times, you know, and I think that there's this interesting, and I was, you know, like I said, I was doing the most in, in that early research, but I, I was kind of trying to think about it as like, what happens in the brain, you know, like, is there this repetitive, you know, strain, you know, often racism, like what if it, you know, this, this proclivity to turn away, you know, so I was really interested in what language does in art and how does one, how is one interpolated by it as I felt I was as, you know, uh, as a particularly bodied black 
you know, light skinned black women of means in these spaces being called in and reading literally every word and, and then others that, you know, that there's this, this turn, right, this procession. And I noticed it, you know, I, I try to stay out of that mode now that, you know, I'm not doing that research anymore, but it's hard, you know, in, in the Faith Ringgold exhibition, I think people um, don't read for many reasons. I think there's just a sheer amount of language and text, but when, you know, when they do, I think you see folks, certain folks smiling and laughing, other folks turning away. You know, I, I think that language for me is really functioning on so many levels. Formally, I think it's functioning at the level of, of content. Um, but then I also think specifically around the work of, you know, in uh, thinking about Black women, um, I think in what Michelle Wallace illuminates is we're outside of tradition, right? So that it becomes out of turn speech when it's against the grain of reality or what people expect to be their museum experience. Oh, this is about race. Or, oh, this is about a black woman's body or, you know, so I don't know. I think, um, you know, that's a lot of rambling to answer your question, which is so important. It's like, what, what role does it play? And I think it's, it's multivalent. You know, I think there's so many different ways you can access and think about language in these works. Can I say something just as a, a response to that? Um, I, hmm, I've worked in museums for a long time and, and trying to understand just what is the right balance of text that you provide for a viewer um, or a visitor that you can hook them a minute and at least get their attention so that they engage with the work. And you know, this is a, it's, it's, an, it's an art, it's not a science. It's, there's no, the calculus is, it changes from, from show to show. One of the things that I think is, um, and, and I don't know if you're supposed to say this about contemporary art. Um, I find the text in the work to provide a level of ex accessibility that I don't always have when I'm looking at other work, right? And I feel like what it does invite an, an audience member to do is to choose, right? In a way, I can, I can engage this this way and then I can move on. Whereas she, I feel like it, it, it is probably received and perceived, and this would be a great study um, as a wonderful um, invitation into the work um, that one often doesn't get in in contemporary art. Um, and I, so in that way, I think there is. I think for many of us, Faith Ringgold was our kind of entry into this, this space, um, into uh, this kind of work. And then there's a breadth and diversity of it that I think she's calling you to, and she's inviting you into that often that invitation for the, for, you know, just the, your general, perhaps not, not, perhaps not art enthusiast is quite welcome. And there is something there that I, um, that I find quite refreshing. And I, I wonder often, like, I wonder what this study would look like with audience members um, if we were to ask them, what does, the, what does the text allow you to do that if it weren't there, you could not? So just something that I think about when I, when I look at her work. Yeah, I think in, in some ways, what, what you're pulling out there, Joy, for me is that recognition precisely of what Stephanie was alluding to earlier with the, the multiple registers that text offers of modes to, to inquire, to engage, to participate. You know, one thing we, we haven't mentioned yet is the children's books for which Faith is so well known. And that Tar Beach for many people was an introduction to a world of imagination, of possibility. Um, and, and for many people of an experience beyond their lived experience, right? It wasn't just people seeing themselves reflected, but seeing something beyond themselves. And, and to your point too, Joy, of what words can institutions hold I think that's that's really critical. Like, how can people access? Are these modes that everyone can access? Probably not. So then, who and how? Can it, it, I? I'd love to hear your thoughts here. I know that you have thought so rigorously about how can language actually be accessed? Can it even? What does it hold? How are you percolating on this? Um, again, I think it's really. I think it's interesting because I think. Um, 
Well, I guess a couple of things come to mind immediately. One, one immediate thought is also thinking about like kind of Glissant and theater and what he says in an exploded discourse about how um, essential sort of like folklore and theater are to the building of nationalism and especially that a reparative kind of black nationalism that comes out of folklore and comes out of like sort of mutual participation and both the construction of like narrative and you know the kind of like I guess um, this is a spiral but you know integration of, of ritual lost or or gained through being a part of this sort of transatlantic process um, and, it, and in ways you know I think um, it is the question of, of that praxis of contrast, right? Like Lisa says that like, you know, like what, what the sort of like detriments of genocidal narratives and slavery and, um, you know, like I think he has a blind spot on patriarchy, but I could say patriarchy, you know, have done to create and destroy or disrupt transatlantic narratives. I think has really fallen on, again, this back, back to truth telling, I think it falls on a lot of black feminist praxis, especially to, to find innovation around, um, you know, I think there's all, like I think of the Bitterness series um, and Sadia Hartman's critical confabulation as like one sort of recuperative process, but also, you know, a lot of psychological processes that, um, you know, like kind of garner emotional uh, volition through the power of their expression. Um, I think about fetishism and like the soft sculptures and, uh, you know, like kind of revitalizing ritual performance to deal with commodity fetishism um, and the fetishism of the black body. Um, so those are all sort of like, I think they're like a matrix of uh, recuperative strategies that I feel really, you know, compelled and like um, super grateful to be a part of that kind of truth building because I do think it, it is something that is like, or it is a, you know, like something like a thing a kind of like uh, psychoanalytic thing, you know what I mean? Or a praxis of seeing um, between the lines, also holding the margin, also being the page, you know, like this kind of this notion of black complexity that I think sees a lot of others, uh, non-black people through um, various political and social questions, various intimate questions uh, for better or worse, right? Like we end up acting as a communication technology um, a first wave uh, uh, native informants, you know what I mean? I think we end up acting as spiritual vessels in many ways as, as the Ringgold work says. And then all those things I think for better or worse politically and aesthetically, like they become a means of black kind of holding on as well as, um, you know, means of expropriation um, of, of constant expropriation of political power. So that was a ramble, but yeah, I think language all plays a part in that and where we find, you know, ways to like become tricksters within language, um, speak between the lines, uh, hold uh, space and pauses, you know, like this is like Moton's in the break. Um, yeah, that, that those become, you know, they become like sight and source for a lot of black feminist praxis. They also become content. I think they become innovation. They become ways of, you know, negotiating um, archive and archivability, and organic and authentic gesture and material conservation too. I feel like is that's a weird thing to think through, but yeah, like I think there's a lot there. Well, and uh, to riff on Candace, what she, you know, what you're articulating here, I think it's also about ontology, right? And it's also about like, survival and and being and and all of these things conflate. You know, it's what Zora Neale Hurston said. You know, you have to speak, right, or else they will kill you. And you know, I think, and I'm butchering it, and say you enjoyed it, and that truth telling or that speak to survive. You know, as as what I think. Faith hold, I mean, Faith Ringgold holds so poetically in tension is both a desire to articulate, um, you know, a kind of Black complexity in and outside of the white gaze or outside of the white um, systems that are largely now engaged with her work. But I also think there's, there's this complex speaking um, of her, of, of our existence, right, through the work, in, in, in actually through the work, both text and image creates kind of a real, like a real, like a real, 
<laughs> in space and time of the museum. So I think that that's also really interesting. And Lord says, if we don't write ourselves into history, right, the language is what we need to do that through. And language is complex, right? Even when we can interrogate English, the English language and how it's wielded. Um, but I think it's also so um, intimately tied up with existence and how we survive in this culture. I think one thing I really want to hold in, in what I heard in that exchange too is this, this slippage or, or perhaps refinement between truth telling and truth building. I think that is actually really critical to both the work of what Ringgold is proposing and, and what each of you are sort of drawing in different directions. That there's, there's an element of possibility around language that is simply expression which is important and necessary, but in my mind almost aligns with particular notions of representation, right? Whereas what I think serves as a through line to the power of some of the work in the exhibition is that it's a truth building. It's an advancement beyond merely telling what is previously thought or known towards constructing something beyond. And I think as it ties to this research of of Ringgold's own, where she's looking to, the, we mentioned the Tibetan Tankas that she looked to and investigated and incorporated, or that she was looking at some of the East African masks or you know all of these different materials, the Harlem Renaissance that she literally grew up in and incorporating that into her practice, weaving this together to become a building, an assemblage, but also a, a fully formed creation that extended it forward. I'd love to hear from each of you too, because each of you are working with research in different ways. You're each incorporating bodies of knowledge, trying to understand where there are links and where there are dissonances. How do you represent, engage with, consider what came before in order to build something forward, to build a truth that, that you want to engage with and that you want others to engage with? That's a million dollar question. In my um, in my work, I think, particularly when you work are in an, a legacy institution um, that had in many ways has has um, sustained and documented or preserved so much of what is used to create either in the past or contemporarily. Um, I. I feel like uh, what we have been doing in many ways is, is working against a grain, is inserting ourselves in a conversation, is saying, no, we actually, we were here, is saying, no, actually, we did do this, is saying, no, we think about this kind of work that we think about the archive differently. It isn't just one thing, it isn't just that it isn't just the papers, um, it is the artwork, it is, the, it, it's so, it's multimodal and it doesn't just, uh, it doesn't just emanate from the, the names you know, right? It is, it's multimodal, but it is, um, it's about so many more people than the people whose names we, we know and can speak. Uh, and so in the, in the work that I do, which is really a we do, it, it is how then as we continue to forge an institution, as we continue to try to sustain an institution and then say what it may be in the future, where, <laughs> where because we can't collect everything, we can't have everything, um, we no longer uh, there are other institutions that do what we do. Um, where, is, where is the space that we enter into the conversation and what can we contribute so that that creation can continue into the future? Um, and I'm not sure if that's a, a, an answer to your question, but because the question is the thing, right? The question is the, is the place. It's the, it's the wrestle with, with the wrestling with what, what can be or what might be, that is the place that I think is not only the right place to live, the safe place to live, because once you start to try to pin it down, um, you lose it. So. It's, 
You know, that's something that I think is so difficult to also to hear as someone who works in an institution is, is the, the thought that once you try to pin it down, you've lost it. Um, it's, I previously worked at another institution where, where there was a literal thought that the exhibition was the pinning of things, right? It was the like signifying, it was the, this is the moment to pause, this is the space to dial in. I don't know, Stephanie, how, how do you hold that in, in your own work? Yeah, I was thinking about that a lot as um, as Joy was talking, and I, you know, I'm actually, I've I've always learned a lot from contemporary artists um, in thinking about what it is that we can do um, beyond the one off or the exhibition. And right now, um, I'm thinking about you know reinstalling Brooklyn Museum's entire American Wing with my colleagues, and you know, thinking about. You know, and I am thinking a lot about narrative, you know, the role of narrative. How do you tell stories without art? Are narratives a trap? Is something like my latest controversial thought, you know, a trap of the canon, right? This idea that time and story kind of unfolds in this like linear teleological march through history, through styles, through movements, through this kind of like, you know, and, and all time doesn't work that way for all cultures and, and certainly all experiences of American art historical traditions. And so I, I am thinking a lot about um, Ringgold's practice. I'm thinking a lot about contemporary artists as, you know, instead of their practices being, I'm also kind of very cognizant of this DEIA moment that I, and I, I hate to call it that, but this moment where I feel like there are, on the one hand is a real genuine interest and engagement and work that's has been existing for us for you know decades but also you know it's I also feel like there's this kind of instrumentalization that I'm wondering if and when it will come to an end and so right now um I'm really trying to think about how I capture not only you know the artworks and shows and in, in, in collection building um endeavors, but really how do we honor, you know, the conceptual rigor, right, the intellectual depth of these artists, the work, you know, that has been done for, for decades, like how do we think, you know, if I want to evacuate, you know, the, the, the canon, or if I want to escape, like how do I create new modes of seeing, coming to see and experience historic art? So that's kind of where I am right now. It's like, instead of instrumentalizing contemporary artist practice, you know, as kind of, um, you know, how do we tell a history or how do we tell, or how do we have encounters with historical work that don't need intervention, you know? Um, and so that's kind of where I'm, I'm leaning and I'm leading and I've learned so much from Ringgold, from artists like Simone Lee who unapologetically center um, the standpoint, right, of black women. That's the ground, that's the air in which we breathe. And so I'm trying to think about how as a curator of a historic American art collection that, you know, has never, you know, and, and Brooklyn is so trans, um, transgressive, transformative in that we actually were collecting, you know, traditionally marginalized artists rather early, right? So I, I came into this position, you know, with, with, um, with works in, in a really strong collection already, but still, you know, the idea that, I could collect my entire career and for six lifetimes and never have kind of parity or equity. So like, how do we do things differently, right? So how do we see and experience art and how do I take what I can learn um, methodologically, theoretically, like how do we treat artists as thinkers too, right? That have so much more to offer in this moment. Um, and Ringgold is one of these artists. Lorena Grady is one of these artists. Simone Lee is one of these artists that are, it's like, how do I create new frameworks, right? For, for, for showing work that starts from this place, you know, just like we start from, you know, um, kind of contemporary, I mean, not contemporary, um, historic kind of like curatorial giants or art historians, or even these theorists that, you know, were so deeply engaged with um, Deleuze, you know, even um, Merleau-Ponty, you know, I'm like, deeply engaged in phenomenology and what embodiment looks and feels like, but then I can really turn to Black feminism, and they can show me how to do it right in the gallery and that's what I'm really committed to I don't have all the answers but I'm certainly like in deep deep dive and and trying to think about how we could do this make this happen I really really appreciate you sharing that and I think that's so important for us to hold as folks who are operating largely in these spheres and asking these questions Candace one thing that I would love to ask you to bring to the table here is your engagement with words online 
thinking about how does this extend forward? How does this extend in sort of new modes of considering the written word? And as Stephanie was talking about these frames and possibilities and sort of reformations, I'm thinking too how Joy and your work too of citation, thinking back to what, what gets referenced, which collection, how, and so much of your work, Candace, with Cassandra Press is deeply citational and still very forward looking. Can, can you speak to that, that practice of, between what it means to work in, in digital spaces, but also the, this effort of building from what happened in the past to move forward? Yeah, I mean, I think um, um, just hearing, you know, Stephanie and Joy speak, it, what I think I have a desire as like a publisher and an artist to see you know, I don't know, something I, I don't, it's hard to like describe, but to hear it all at one time is how I kind of have been thinking about it. Um, so I, I think I often like struggle with feeling or, you know, rationalizing a lot of what we just, you know, sort of discussed, like um, definitely something that I think about a lot is something that Leela Weinraub said once um, to Muriel Miller Young, uh, who wrote A Taste for Brown Sugar, Leela Weinraub made a uh, this documentary called Shakedown. Um, and she said, um, you know, like for a long time, she didn't show Shakedown because the world wasn't, she didn't think the world was like sort of ready to speak about it. And I think a lot about, um, you know, those material practices of black feminist thought. And I see so many, you know, histories um, that, you know, I think if we really, if we're really sort of honest about them, the consequences of having, you know, um, commercial or commodity sort of like value in a lot of these systems is still really violent and extremely genocidal, still produces, you know, scopic regimes that rely on caricature and fetish and, um, you know, Debbie Downer here, but it's like there's, there's like, a, you know, there's, there's a lot of architecture, I think, of safety in those modes of caricature and, and representation that I see, you know, very active digitally. And it almost feels like, you know, a completely, a new sort of space of territory or charting, um, the deepening even sometimes of a lot of those means of exchange and especially almost like the bare bones of their social currency. Like I'm thinking about things like, you know, the NFT slave auction and, um, you know, black fishing, black face online. And I think where Cassandra kind of steps in is like that we have a lot of, um, you know, I think uh, answering the call of, you know, younger artists and people, um, like Rhea Dillon in conversation, or even like, you know, scholars that we work with, like um, Denise Reiner or Yania Lee, or, um, you know, scholars that I think I'm in dialogue with around the struggle for you know, privacy, uh, opacity, but also um, against invisibility, I think has rendered a lot of those digital conversations very, very potent in terms of like how we sort of understand social scripts, commodifications, internalizations, um, I think one thing that was really interesting about reading the Zook text on Color by Fox is sort of thinking through, and, and another author who I didn't get a chance to <laughs> include in the slides, but Joy James, who talks about the captive maternal and that potential for reproducing culture, but also reproducing um, certain means of, of captivity, I think are, are really, you know, like what's at stake online as we open up a Black chattering class or a Black class or forms of communication um, that, you know, I, I don't think we have had in the world before, ways of experiencing the archive as individuals, as like a populist kind of um, republic in and of ourselves, right, an underserved uh, caste or class or um, new gender uh, kind of conversations that can happen online because we, we can see each other's conditions a little bit more clearly or we're especially expressing, you know, the condition and, and all of its nuance and complexity. Um, yeah, I think that digital conversation is really apt for, and I think it really commands a re-address uh, of a lot of the material that, you know, make up the archives, but also a lot of the material that make up our social scripts or our social conditions. Um, and I'm super excited to be a part of that, a part of this generation, I guess, or part of this conversation that's happening right now in terms of how the archive can be reframed, if it's worth it. Um, if certain, you know, institutions or certain violences of collection, um, you know, can really be recovered or recuperated. Um, and yeah, and sort of like really invested, especially in like, you know, 
understanding the power of narrative. I think that's something Stephanie was talking about, understanding the power of narrative and um, how a lot of you know those kind of surveyed spaces also still engender a lot of that power um, to the subject. I think that's maybe a political space of hope and reclamation, potential reclamation. Uh, yeah, so is that I, I love that you started out thinking it was going to be such a Debbie Downer bit, and here you are, like ending on hope and liberation. <laughs> like, you really did a quick turn on us there. Um, but I think too that that does point directly toward toward something that I think is evident across Ringgold's work, right? Like, yes, yeah, she's confronting these very real, very harsh, very genuine truths that she has experienced, that she has encountered, that she has considered. You know, and and looking across the the broad arc of her practice, that she was starting out in this space of intense, outside beyond the walls. The walls were hardly even in sight. You know, when she was doing the traveling shows of the tankas and some of the fabric works, that it was you know, the the lore that they were just rolled up in the car and traveling alongside her to these college speaking tours. And then, but in that practice, building her own space and one that she was concurrently inviting people into. I think that's something that I see across each of your work that I find particularly compelling. You know, as, as you've each been speaking, the way that, that you're both immediately wrestling with, yes, there are clearly boundaries and limits to what's currently available. And clearly that's not where you're gonna stop. I think, you know, not to be Pollyanna about it, but just to recognize that if we are to do something that is going to be better than what we've been given, it will require us to think beyond the structures that we have. Like to see that across each of your practices, I think is is incredibly heartening, frankly. So I I am honored to be to be sharing this space with with each of you. You know, there is, there is one one question that I did want to get to here in the comments before before we wind down, recognizing uh, of course time and the fact that it's a Friday. Um, but this this one note was saying, you know, looking at Ringgold's narrative quilts amazed by her willingness to speak and narrate around her works. Um, one, uh, again, from this comment, one of the many possible interpretations of the text is facilitating a form of intimate, unimposing way of artist audience interaction that perhaps was largely absent from the art world in the 60s. That said, I do find the mode of interaction somewhat jarring in the setting of a museum, a formal, rather indifferent space of exhibition. And, and the person goes on then to ask, I wonder if Ringgold herself has ever commented on the effect of seeing her works on display in a museum. You know, and I'll, I'll quickly provide a bit there on that, you know, Ringgold of course has seen this exhibition. <laughs> she did come through um, and has seen it multiple times. And, and one of the things she says so often in that has been, you know, what she remembers about the work, the fact that, you know, and people will ask her, oh, do you remember about this? Do you remember that? And, and she often will reply with, you know, her, her wonderful frankness and good humor, like, of course, I, I made it. Like, yes, and it is all now present here. And I think, too, that question of where is the space for this work to live? I don't know that that's an, a question Ringgold has given us a direct answer for. And I think that's also a space that we can and should swim. You know, where does this work live? I'd be interested to hear for each of you, perhaps as a final wrap up question, where does your work live now? And where do you want it to live? Perhaps really blue sky thinking here, but I, I'm genuinely, this is not coming from any like outside bit, but I am curious, given that I resonate personally with many of the values and aspirations you're, you expose so far, where does this lead for you either individually, collectively? How do you see this moving forward? Right now, it lives at the Brooklyn Museum. <laughs> I'm quite literally still in my office. Um, no, but I believe in institutions. I know not everybody does, um, and and I'm I'm not ready to burn them down. You know, like I believe that there's a different way, right, to see, experience, and come to know, right. Um, American art in particular, but these spaces, you know, and I feel like we're finally in a moment for, you know, the moment I think maybe many of us, um, Lorraine O'Grady also had a similar um, sentiment that her audience was to come, you know, that's what she was writing and, and saying in the 70s and 80s, um, late 70s and mostly in the 80s that, you know, her audience, she was reading Hegel and, you know, her audience was to come and I, I believe that it's here. Right, I think we are in a moment, and I, I like I said, I well, let's go there. Let's Pollyanna it up. Um, we can end on a high note, but I, I do think we are in a moment where I think we can get away with a lot of the things many of us have been dreaming about for a long time.
that is, I like that a lot. Um, getting away with it. Uh, because I tend to think of, um, of history as progress and then regress or action and then reaction. Um, I, 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 I don't know if I, I am there where you are just yet, Stephanie. Um, I too believe in institutions um, and I believe that institutions can exist in, in multiple ways and have existed in multiple ways. I think that where I live in where I think about my work is how do I facilitate pathway for people to continue to practice this work, continue to collect, continue to think about preservation, continue to think about who's next or what do we need to, what do we need to preserve for the future? Um, and that is exciting to me. I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, um, but I feel like the work is in building a, an institution strong enough to, to withstand whatever that might be. So that's kind of where, where I am right now. It's such a funny question for like many reasons, I guess. Is we, yeah, the Cassandra work lives in so many different places. I guess it's like, it's not really designed for me to know that where it lives. I just kind of like messily <laughs> throw it out. Um, and of course the studio work in a really practical way you know, lives with people who buy it and institutions who buy it. Um, I think that's interesting because it happens whether or not we believe in each other. <laughs> uh, so there's something to say for that maybe. But I think, I think when I think about what the work is across the studio and Cassandra, I think it is a lot more about, about composition. And um, I keep coming back to the word composition or, um, and I, I hope that it lives in, in its compositions. I think I hope it lives in like, um, you know, those registers of things that are being like conjoined or pulled apart, uh, how things are being arranged, I guess. Cause I think maybe that's where, maybe that's where the shifting and the ability to sort of shift perceptual models or shift viewing practice or something um, is, feels really exciting to me. I want to thank you each for being willing to, if I can truly steal and shift the meaning of the word composition, creating truly a composition this evening and taking the time providing yourselves, your thoughts, your words, and your actions. This is a wonderful, wonderful collection to, to embark on a weekend with. So thank you each. For anyone who's watching and hasn't yet seen the Ringgold exhibition, obviously I'm contractually obliged to say and personally deeply feel that you must come visit this weekend. It's a glorious weekend to see the work. And also there's an exhibition catalog. There's plenty of ways. Beyond that, engage with the work of each of these wonderful panelists. We'll plug the Brooklyn Museum. We'll plug Schomburg. We'll plug every exhibition Candace is in. Thank you all and have a wonderful, wonderful night. Have a good one, folks. Thank you.